I want to share with you about frost. What is frost? Why does it cause damage? And what are some things we can do about it? Hey everybody, Chad Cruiser here with Health and Homestead. And we had a beautiful frost last night. Here I am next to my kale and a couple different kinds. I have some of the purple kale, some of the green kale. And, and kale does just fine under a frost, a number of frosts. Actually, what happens is it actually tastes better sweeter it softens it up and so it's beneficial to certain plants and to other plants it just simply destroys them so what is frost what's the difference between uh, frost damage and freezing damage there are actually differences so frost damage takes place as the temperature gets down to freezing 32 degrees or below and as it gets to this point inside of the cell wall the structure of the plant itself what ends up happening is as it freezes, the ice crystals begin to form. And as they form, these sharp crystals begin to pierce through the structure of the cell wall. And as they do that, well, when it's still frosting or the frost is still out, the plants can look fine other than the fact that they have a frost. But what happens is as the frost goes away as the warm as it begins to warm back up since the cell wall is broken you can imagine i've heard somebody use the illustration of the cell wall imagine it being like a bunch of water balloons stuck together now it's kind of a it's not a perfect illustration if you froze them and you popped them they would be fine as long as they're frozen but once the water starts to melt and as the frost begins to go away from the plant it begins to just kind of uh, droops and it dies. And so the water then doesn't get up from the ground in the future. It can't really make it into the plant like it used to. And so that's what a frost is, but that's different from a freeze. A freeze can take place when there's not enough humidity outside to cause a frost, but yet it's still 32 degrees or below. And as a result, what ends up happening is, well, it's still in certain plants that are susceptible, not all plants, but certain plants, especially, yeah, obviously any tropical kind of plant almost, but the outer portions of the plant, especially the tender leaves and so forth that are most susceptible can have freeze damage, even if there was no frost. But either one can be detrimental to plants that are susceptible to it. But once again, there's certain things like brassicas, uh, my Jerusalem artichoke did fine for a number of frosts until it got down below 28. Once you get down to about 28 degrees or below, you start getting into what is called a hard frost. Many plants do just fine when they have a, a, a more just normal frost of 32, 31 degrees, they'll do fine. But some plants, as they tip down to 28, that's when the damage begins to affect it. That's what happened with our Jerusalem artichoke. The leaves started browning at that point and finally the upper structure of the plant just simply died off. Now, another important point is the fact that there may be times like you wake up and you see on the roofs of your house, the houses around you, that there's a frost up on the roof. You may not see it on the ground. You see, what happens is during the day when the sun is out, even if it's not sunny necessarily, the sun is hitting the earth. The rays of the sun are hitting the earth. They're heating it. So you have this thermal mass of the earth. Then when the evening comes and night comes, you may remember that typically, unless you have kind of a strange uh, weather pattern taking place, typically just before daybreak, so just before the light is the coldest time of the day. So as the temperature is going down and it just dips down into that 32 degrees temperature, the roof sometimes, because you don't have that same amount of thermal mass, you do have some in the house, but not as much as you would have in the earth itself. And so what happens is the roof may often frost, but because of the temperature that is held in the earth, it keeps your plants from getting that frost, obviously on those particular occasions. Other times it's just too cold out and you get a frost right on the ground right away. But often you'll have that. So the earth can actually help. Now, keeping that in mind, we can use that to our benefit, recognizing the, the mass, the thermal mass that is in the earth. You can have certain things like high tunnels or you know, big examples where you can actually walk under them, but you can have the little hoops over your plants. Some of the things you can do if you just wanna save a few plants here or there, is you can simply get something as, uh, you know, just something like a sheet. You got some old bed sheets or something, just wrapping them over. What it can do is it can he keep that heat from the earth trapped in there, and that will help keep the frost away from killing 
whatever plants you have, unless it gets too cold. If it gets cold enough, your sheet just isn't going to work. But if it's just dropping down to 32 or just a degree or two below, often the heat of the earth will keep your plant from being destroyed. Another thing you've probably noticed is often the coldest nights are the nights that are just as clear as can be. The nights where you look out and it's just beautiful and dark, except for you have all the beautiful stars around. Those nights are absolutely beautiful, but they're often the coldest. And the reason is because when you have the clouds up above, as once again the sun heats the earth during the day, that temperature, that heat that is collected begins to radiate back up. And as it, as it radiates back up, it is insulated by the cloud cover, so it actually keeps the heat there on the earth at that time. And so because of that, those nights tend to be warmer as a result. Now, something that fits right along with this is the fact that air that is more humid, it, is, it takes actually longer to both heat up and cool down. Just like if you had a glass of water, how long would it take to heat a glass of water versus heating the air next to the water? Well, obviously the air is much quicker to heat up than the water itself. And so too, when it's humid out, when it's humid, it actually takes longer to either cool down or heat up. Another thing to think about is that when you are, if you have hilly property, you may know, you probably remember back from science class, that colder air is denser than warmer air. Obviously the heat rises. You can feel that just right now we have the wood stove going in the house and I could literally, I was upstairs and our wood stove is on the main floor and as I went upstairs I could put my hand up and I could feel the warmth up above and I could put my hand down and I could feel the cool down below. And that's because heat rises, because it's less dense than the cool air. And so too on your property, if you have hilly property and it's one of those nights that's just going to get dipped down into the, you know, freezing temperatures, 32, what ends up happening is the lower areas as that dense air pools down into those, those cold pockets, you're most likely to have the frost down the, you know, further down. And so if it's just dipping in, to those temperatures, you may want to make sure to take care of the things that are furthest down first to save those things. Obviously, once again, if it's going to get cold enough, everything's going to get, uh, you know, you're going to struggle if you don't have things covered, but you might want to pay attention to the things that are down in the deeper pocket. Now, this area on my property actually sl slopes down to the south and a bit to the west, and a southwesterly slope to a property or to land actually creates the most amount of heat in the soil. The reason is is because the you probably remember the old song day is dying in the west so it rises in the east and as it comes up in the east and it moves over toward the south the south facing property gets the most sun. The sun is hitting from the south it's hitting this area and as the sun moves over toward the west where it sets, it's getting, it's putting as much of that heat into the earth itself. And so they, those areas, because they're trapping that heat better than areas, if you, for instance, had a north sloping, you can just, I don't know if you can see it, but my hand now is in the shade because this would be a north slope here. And so it would be, it, the slope itself would block the sun or the hill or the trees would block the sun. And so things here are going to take much more time to heat up. So they're more prone to being cold. Now you can use that to the benefit of your garden or your farm or your orchard because if you're growing food, often if you're growing, you know, plants like this, you want them to have as much heat as possible. Unless you're in a really, really hot area, maybe a slope in the northern direction would be actually beneficial to you so that you get less heat if you're in an extremely hot area. But for a cooler region like I live in, having it on that southern or southwest slope is the best uh, alignment to have your property. They know this with, you know, vineyards and these kind of things. South southwest is the best slope to have. But this is something to also consider. This can also cause trouble to an orchard in the situation that because it has that southern slope, it's getting the most heat. And then in the spring, it's going to be most likely to bud early. If it buds early, it may have one of those early frosts or those rather late frosts, I should say, come in and destroy the early growth of that plant. So some people actually with certain, certain uh, plants like certain trees like peaches, 
putting them on a kind of a northern slope sometimes will actually be beneficial for you because what it will do is it'll keep them in the cold longer so that all those late frosts will be over with when it starts to really bud out and hopefully you'll have a healthy tree. So depending on the situation you're in, if you're new to an area, you might want to talk to the old timers in the area. They might know, yeah, yeah, a, a northern slope is better for the peach trees or what have you, but that's something to consider. Now, if you end up liking this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share it with your friends. God bless and have a fantastic day.